Have you ever been told to take heart or be brave or take courage without being given a reason to? Think about, think about this way. Think about a, a child who's scared of the dark and his impatient dad says to him, Come on, be a big boy, be brave. It's not going to help a lot, is it? It's not going to help much for most kids. But it might help a lot more if, if the dad actually comes into the bedroom and shows that there's no monster in the closet, right? It, it, it's going to be a lot more helpful if, if the dad says, listen, I'm going to be right here, right here, just in the next room. I'm always going to be there for you. That's going to help a lot more because now there's something underneath those words. Now there's something uh, as a foundation, something behind those words. You see, we need a solid source for our confidence, right? Courage, courage relies on, on having something strong, something solid, something dependable, something that's in control underneath and behind it. I mean, imagine that you took all the money from a Monopoly game and went on a shopping trip with it, right? That, that whole shopping trip is just going to blow up and, and fall apart the moment you get to the first cash register, right? Because there's nothing behind that fake money. There needs to be something behind it. And this is what I've seen in the lives of people who maybe finally, let's say, finally start coming to church, maybe, maybe later on in their life. And maybe they've spent a good part of their lives kind of confident in who they are, confident in their own lives, confident about their lives until, until they experience something, until they go through the loss of a job or a, a very sick child or a relationship meltdown or breakdown or a health issue. And it turns out then that their confidence really had nothing underneath it. Their confidence had nothing behind it. Their confidence had nothing solid, no foundation. And it ends up bursting like a balloon. And that's when they realize, that's when they realize that they need something more solid, more strong underneath. That's when they realize that they were not in control. And so they needed to start finding their confidence in the one who is in control. On page after page of the Bible, we're told to take heart. We're told to, to be brave, really. We're told to, to take courage. Do not be afraid, but always, always by pointing us to the solid source of confidence that we have in Christ. You see, Jesus is better. Jesus is better than anything else that we could rely on. No, no matter what it is that we're facing, Jesus is better. No matter what problem is in front of us, no matter how big that problem is, Jesus is bigger. When we're, when we're scared... When we're scared, we look to a, to a source of strength. Think about it. Children look to their parents. Uh, players look to their coach. Citizens look to their leaders. We look to a source of strength. We, we, we need to we, we find a, we confidence in, in somebody who's in control. And so when we're wondering who's in control, we need to look to the one who is in control. Looking 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 inside ourselves and just trying to be brave or take heart isn't going to work. Courage needs a source of confidence. Courage needs a foundation. Courage comes from something outside of us. Courage must be derived by someone who, who actually is in control. So, open up now to Daniel 7. And here we're going to see that God gives Daniel a dream that reveals who really is in control. Verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream, and visions passed through his mind as he was lying in bed. He wrote down the substance of his dream. 
So God pulls back the curtain and, and reveals things that we could not otherwise have known. God has a message that he, that he not only wants to share with Daniel, but he, he wants Daniel to write down and share with God's people. It's, it's a vision, so it's symbolic. It's a vision symbolically pointing to something deeper. Verses 2 and 3, Daniel said, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me were the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. So the great sea that is stirred up is all the political unrest that takes place in the five centuries before Christ comes. And notice that the four winds of heaven are stirring it up. God is the one stirring it up. And so what we see here is that that God... God is controlling, God is even controlling the very things that are actively rising in opposition to him. God is even in control of this. These four beasts, these four great beasts, symbolize or represent four kingdoms that each are going to play a role in the story of God's people and in the story of Christ. Let's look at the first one. Verse 4, the first was like a lion, and it had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off, and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a human being, and the mind of a human was given to it. All right, the lion with wings like an eagle is definitely Babylon, all right, the first great kingdom of the world. In the ruins of Babylon, archaeologists have found many statues of lions with eagle's wings, guarding over the walls, guarding over the gates of the ancient city. The winged lion was the symbol of Babylonian power. And those, those wings being ripped off so that it stood and was given the heart of a man could be, could be referring to King Nebuchadnezzar's humiliation and restoration that we talked about a few weeks ago. So lion is Babylon. Verse 5, And there before me was a second beast, which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up and eat your fill of flesh. Okay, the bear is the Medo-Persian empire of King Cyrus when, when they conquered Babylon. So this bear has two sides. Medes and Persians, but one of the sides, it was raised up on one of the sides, so one of the sides is much greater than the other, the Persian um, side being much greater than the Median side. And it has three ribs in its mouth, could refer to the three nations that it conquered to get there. And there's a voice directing it. There's a voice telling it to get up and eat, to get up and, and conquer, which could be referring to the fact that God himself directed King Cyrus to conquer the nations he did, and then eventually send his people back to Jerusalem. Verse 6, After that I looked, and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard, and on its back it had four wings like those of a bird. This beast had four heads, and it was given authority to rule. So the leopard... Smaller than a lion, smaller than a bear, but faster was Greece. Alexander the Great, with an army of only 30,000 soldiers, conquered the massive Medo-Persian Empire in only 12 years. That's fast. And so the wings on this leopard probably point out to the speed by which this was done. And notice that it was given authority. It didn't just take this authority. It was given authority to given by God, because that's probably the only thing that could even explain how something like this was possible. And it had four heads. Alexander died young, and his kingdom then was passed on. It was divided up into four parts and passed on to four new rulers who were his generals. Verse 7, after that, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful, It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. The terrifying beast with iron teeth, this is Rome. 
Notice iron, just like the iron uh, legs kingdom um, pictured in Nebuchadnezzar's dream at the beginning of this book. And in Hebrew thought, a horn symbolized power. So this kingdom has ten horns. Think of, think of it this way. It, ten times the power of any nation in front of it. It was different from all the other nations. Because when this nation, when this terrifying nation conquered people, it didn't just deport and relocate the people of that nation. It crushed, devoured, and trampled them. Verse 8, while I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them. And three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a human being and a mouth that spoke boastfully. So from this earthly kingdom become, comes a worldly power that, that it speaks against God and, and tries to put himself in the place of God. And so you have this earthly power that's opposing God with the spiritual power of Satan behind it. It's scary, isn't it? Scary to think of a, a worldly power, an earthly entity, an earthly power speaking against God, opposing God, and calling itself God, and putting itself in the place of God, and Christ the King who rules over all. This is scary stuff. But be brave. Take heart. Because God the King is coming. Verses 9 to 12. The ancient of, the, as I looked, thrones were set in place, and the ancient of days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. And then I continued to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beasts had been stripped of their authority but were allowed to live for a period of time. So the Ancient of Days, the, the God, the everlasting God, the eternal God, takes his seat on the throne. This is, this is very reminiscent, this whole part of Scripture. We see, this, we see this pictured again much later in the book of Revelation. The eternal God, the Ancient of Days, taking his seat on the throne. This is a, this is a picture of, uh, this is a courtroom picture, a picture of judgment. And you have the books are open. In those books are written the names of everyone who trusts in the mercy of God. To have one's name written on those books is to, have, is to be saved. To have one's name blotted out from those books is, is to be lost. And our names are in those books because of the mercy of God. And so we're going to be judged either on our own deeds, which aren't going to work very well, or we're going to be judged based on the deeds of the perfect sinless Son of God when we trust in Him which is good news for us because that's why our names are written in that book because in God's courtroom of judgment we've been judged by Jesus' deeds and not ours. Thanks be to God. Sentences are going to be handed out to, to, to anyone who relies on anything other than God, anything other than the mercy of God and His Son and what He's done for us. And so what this vision is showing not only Daniel but us is that God's ultimate victory over evil might be a long time coming from Daniel's perspective. There's a lot of history to come yet, but it will be coming. The same thing we wait for today, it will be coming. Verses 13 and 14 then. In my vision at night I looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worship him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. 
and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. That son of man, the son of man is Jesus. The son of man, this this term found in the book of Daniel, is the phrase, the term that Jesus used more often than any other phrase to describe himself, to refer to himself. Of course, he is a son of man because he was born a son of man when he became a human being. He's also the son of God who came here to win the victory over evil by living, dying, and rising again for us. And when Jesus ascended into heaven victorious, he was visibly showing visibly showing that he, that he completed the mission he was sent to earth to do. And now he was returning to his father, returning to the ancient of days, sitting on his throne, returning to the right hand of the ancient of days. And this was the moment, this was the moment where that, that familiar passage to many of us, this is the moment where God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Daniel pictures him coming with the clouds of heaven. So in, in, that, in that climactic moment, when Jesus is on trial, when he's being put on trial to be put to death, in the climactic moment of his trial, he's asked to find to say who he is. And he answers. He plainly answers who he was. He says, yes, yes, I am the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. But he doesn't stop there. He continues. And he continues by actually referencing this passage from Daniel chapter 7. He, virtually quoting this passage, he goes on to say, he says, yes, I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. That's what Jesus says when he's on trial. What do they do? They sentence him to death. But his death led to his resurrection and the victory over sin and evil. And then when he ascends into heaven, when he ascends to the right hand of God, He ascends to the seat of all glory and power and authority. And Daniel 7 says that, that this Son of Man would be given authority, glory, and power. Well, right before Jesus ascended into heaven, these are the words that he spoke to his followers. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So who is in control? Who is the one in authority and power? It's the one who loved you so much that he was willing to give his life for you. So, are we going to bow our knees to him? Or are we going to bow our knees to the things of this world? Are we going to rely on worldly powers? Or are we going to rely on the one who is controlling them? Are we going to fear uh, the chaos of the world? Or are we going to trust the one who is using it all for our good? Think about this. Think about this. Long after, long after King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon and Cyrus of Persia and Alexander of Greece were gone, the most powerful man in the world sat on a throne in Rome. Just like this vision God gave Daniel said it would happen. Now his, his empire and his rule became so large that the world had never seen anything like it. His kingdom covered more than three million square miles. He, he ruled, he ruled, the, he literally ruled the known world. He ruled the rulers. People started calling him the king of kings. 
His, his rule, his rule was so unchallenged that the whole world found itself um, in the midst of what was called the peace of Rome. It's not that everyone wanted to be ruled by Rome, but his power and his army was so strong and so unbeatable that no one had any choice about it. This was the terrifying beast with iron teeth. He eliminated every one of his enemies one by one until there were just no enemies left. Even his own Senate started calling him Caesar Augustus, the grand and majestic one. Rome built statues of him. People began worshiping him as the king of kings. He was so powerful. His his army was so huge that it had over half a million soldiers. Half a million soldiers. That took a lot of money. But an ancient historian named Luke tells us how one day Caesar got an idea about how he was going to pay for all those soldiers. This ancient historian tells us, and it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. So Caesar simply made a decree and the world scrambled to obey. And so 1,500 miles away, in, in a very obscure little province, a poverty-stricken couple who were expecting is now, were now forced to make a very treacherous journey at the whim of this king. The result? A child was born in a little town. Oh, a little town that also just happened to be the same one mentioned in an ancient Hebrew prophecy about where the Messiah would be coming from. Joseph and Mary didn't live in Bethlehem, and they would never have gone to Bethlehem. Except that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. Now, why? Why did this happen? Well, if you would ask Caesar, Caesar would have said it was because he made a decree. He would have said it was because he was in control. Caesar thought he was in control. But was he really? Was he really? Because the angels weren't singing in Rome. The angels were singing in Bethlehem. And Caesar thought that his throne and his rule was secure as any throne or rule could be. But yet the true kingdom was lying in a manger in Bethlehem. Today, Caesar has only one palace left in this world. And it isn't in Rome. It's in Las Vegas. But that baby lying in the manger in Bethlehem is enthroned in the hearts and lives of millions of people in every continent of the world. How is that possible? How is that possible? We are not in control. We think we are, but we aren't. Kings are not in control. They think they are, but they aren't. Kings come and kings go. Kingdoms come and kingdoms go. And that was the point of this vision that God gave Daniel. God is the one who is in control. Even when we're wondering who is in control, even when it doesn't look like to us things are in control, I'm sure it didn't look like to Joseph and Mary um, as they're traveling uh, expecting a child that things were in control. But all along, God was in control even when we're wondering who is in control, even when the world rages around us in chaos, in pandemic, in disruption, in difficulty, God is in control. He always has been. He always will be. He's always using it for our good. And so it is always better to rely on the one who is in control. Jesus is in control. And so relying on Jesus is better than relying on anything else in this world or in this universe. There's nothing better to rely on than relying on Jesus because Jesus is better. Jesus is better. Jesus is better than the world. Jesus is better than the world, better than anything money can buy, better than anything you can buy, better than anything you can add to your portfolio, better than any website, better than any relationship, better than any new fad. Better than any new system that you can design to help 
get something done. Better than any skill you can learn to handle things in your life. Jesus is better. Jesus is better than Jesus is better than being ruled by worries over your problems. Jesus is better than serving as a slave to your impulses and temptations that bring you down. Jesus is better than that job that might be not be giving him glory the way you know it could be. Jesus is better than your past. He's better than your present. He's better than the most wonderful future that you can imagine. Jesus is better. Jesus is better than than the greatest attempts of governments and agencies to bring an end to this pandemic. Jesus is better than any worldly attempts to deal with it. Jesus is better. So, take heart. Be brave. Because you have a reason to. It's it's not an empty thing with nothing behind it. You have a reason to take heart and be brave. Even when you're wandering, who is in control. Remember the upper room, the the night um, before Jesus was crucified, the night that he was arrested. And he's in the upper room with his disciples. And Jesus was preparing his disciples for his approaching departure. Now, he knows their limitations. He knows that there's nothing that these confused and stumbling individuals are going to be able to do in order to change the world or even change their neighborhood if left to their own devices. Not even to mention the troubles and the hardships and the persecutions they're going to face. The odds against them, humanly speaking, were 90 trillion to one. But Jesus wasn't worried about any of that. He's the calmest one in the room. And so he looks at their anxious faces and he says these words. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Let that sink in. That even though you're going to have trouble in this world, Jesus has overcome the world. Let that sink in. Jesus is better than the world. The world throws a lot of stuff at you. A lot of hardships, a lot of chaos, a lot of difficulty. It throws a lot of stuff at all of us. And so, sure, you have worries. You have concerns. You, you, there, there's moments of doubt, I'm sure, lapses in your confidence. And I'm sure at times you're wondering who is in control. And I'm sure at times you wake up just overcome with fear. But listen, instead of only telling Jesus about your worries, why don't you also try telling your worries about Jesus? (laughs) Tell them that he is greater. Tell them that Jesus is better. Tell them that he is the one. He is always the one who is control. Always. Tell your worries that Jesus is in control. He's always the one who is in control. And so that's why you can put your confidence in him. Put your confidence in him, friends, and take heart. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for being here with us today. Not only for being with us, but, but ruling from the right hand of God over all things with all power and authority. Our knees bow to you today because you are above all and you have done everything for us. So no matter how difficult life around gets us or how, how many struggles we go through, remind us through your word every day. Remind us every day that we can take heart because you have overcome the world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.